Good morning, church. My name is Claire. I serve on staff here. Um, I work in the office with administration and then also with missions. I'm going to be reading part of today's text. We're going to be starting in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. This is the word of the Lord. Man, well, I'm glad to be back with you today. Had a good vacation with my family last week. Thank you to Brandon for preaching for us. Also, uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but last week in his sermon, uh, Brandon talked about the, the sermon that Stephen preached in Acts and how it's much, much longer than the sermons preached by Peter. And so in this equation, he's more like Stephen and I'm more like Peter. So y'all can be glad about that. Y'all, I, I told that joke in the first service and then I preached really long. So I won't do it again. We're going we're gonna to have to get started today, get in the middle of it, so I uh, don't have to eat my words twice. We'll just only do that once. So if you've been with us through the book of Acts, you know that the book of Acts is the story of how Jesus Christ is building his church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it began with a group of apostles performing signs and wonders on the day of Pentecost. God does miraculous things. Thousands of men and women come to believe, but it didn't stop with the apostles. Uh, God began to use ordinary men and women. So he saw Stephen, who was, who was a deacon, but he wasn't an apostle. You know what I mean? Uh, God used deacon to, or Stephen to preach the gospel before the ruling council at the time. We saw last week Philip. He goes to an Ethiopian eunuch, and he begins to read the word with him and just tell him, hey, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what the word means in this uh, eunuch who was a ruling official in the court of Candace takes the gospel. It's now gone outside of Jerusalem. It's in Judea. It's Samaria. It's in Ethiopia now. And so the gospel is growing. It's not just the apostles who have the Holy Spirit, but it's all God's people have the Holy Spirit. They're scattered across the known world at the time. More and more men and women are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. But just so it would be very clear, that there aren't people who are beyond the grip of God's grace, that there isn't a group of people out there that's beyond saving, God took it a step further. And we're going to see that illustrated in the life of the man we're going to see today. It's a man by the name of Saul. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 58. We're just going to take a peek here, and then we'll jump ahead. Uh, but there's a really important detail that you need to know about this man named Saul. Acts chapter 7, verse 58. They, they're about to stone Stephen. They've driven him out of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish ruling body. They've driven him out, and they've pushed him outside of the city. In verse 58, it says, When they'd driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, if you were a good Jew in the first century, you would probably have started scratching your head at this point. If you understood how Jewish culture, how the religious system worked throughout history, you would have thought, huh, that's a really strange thing to put together. We see that this man, young man named Saul is there uh, at the stoning of Stephen. He's there in an official capacity. That's what it means that they laid their robes at the feet of him. He was there giving approval on behalf of the Sanhedrin for the stoning that was taking place. And so here is Saul, this young man, uh, and he's, he's, he's representing the Sanhedrin, but as a young man, he shouldn't have been able to do that. Young man, by the way, means 40 and under, so I'm still a young man for a couple more months in my, my life. And so uh, here, here's why it was so complex, or why it might have made you scratch your head if you were a believer in the first century. Uh, young men didn't represent the Sanhedrin. That was for older men. 
That was for the mature, the learned, the wise. Young men didn't get to do this. Uh, you read scholars about this, and it, they like go crazy. You know, they're trying to answer, how could this young man Saul be representing the Sanhedrin? He wasn't old enough, right? He didn't have all the, the credentials and things. How in the world could he have represented the Sanhedrin? Well, here's the first thing that I want you to know about Saul this morning. He was no ordinary young man. As a matter of fact, Saul, according to the law, was more righteous than you or I would ever hope to be. So just to give you Saul's breakdown, he was a man who's trained uh, under uh, uh, the guy named Gamaliel. He was uh, a really noteworthy Pharisee within the Jewish ruling council within the synagogue there. Uh, the Pharisees were in a minority, but when Gamaliel spoke, people listened. He was kind of the leading intellectual of their day, and Saul was trained under this guy. But it didn't stop there. In Galatians 1.14, we're told that this man Saul had advanced in Judaism beyond many of his contemporaries among his countrymen. He was in rabbinical school. He's training to be a rabbi, training under Gamaliel. And among all of his peers, Saul had stood out. He got it. He understood the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. He got the law. He got the prophets. He had that stuff down better than anybody else. Even as a young man, he excelled far beyond his peers. And it tells us this, that he was more zealous for his ancestral traditions. So you have the Sanhedrin, a group of older, wiser men. They've been around for a long time. And yet, in the midst of this is a young man named Saul who was trained or the most noteworthy intellectual uh, within the Sanhedrin of the Jewish rulers. He was trained under Gamaliel. But on top of that, man, he was sharp. He was brilliant. He, out, he excelled all of his, his peers. He was even zealous for his ancestral traditions, which young people never, never are, right? And so here's this young man named Saul. He's zealous for their traditions. He knows the word richly, but it goes even further than that. It says in Acts 22, or I'm sorry, in, in Philippians 3, 5, and 6, he, Paul tells us about himself. Um, Saul tells us about himself. He was a Hebrew among Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. And as to the righteousness which is in the law, he was found blameless. So you have this young man trained under kind of the most noteworthy scholar, knew the word in and out. He was zealous for the, his ancestral traditions and when it came to following the law, he did so to the letter. Now, this doesn't mean he never sinned. It just meant that when he sinned, he offered the exact right sacrifice at the exact right time. He was tithing of the things he was supposed to tithe of. He didn't work on the Sabbath. He was killing it as a Jew. So the first thing I want you to know about Saul was he was more righteous, according to the law, than you or I could ever hope to be. But there's another thing that you need to know about Saul. And while he was more righteous according to law than you or I will ever be, he was also far more sinful than you or I would ever be. That in this description that they laid their coats at the feet of this young man named Saul, um, that's because these men had a battle on their hands. Uh, when it came time to stone somebody, they didn't just stand there and be like, all right, hit me with it. Uh, they fought it. And they fought it hard, and if you would have watched, it would have been gripping and gut-wrenching. Uh, the men who laid their coats aside, it's because they were about to throw down. Uh, they were about to have to wrestle this man into submission, likely injure him in some way to the point that they could get him down on his knees uh, and ultimately beat him with rocks until he was dead. The, the prize for these men who would wrestle Stephen to the ground was that they got to cast the first stone. And here is Saul giving hearty approval. He is the one there giving the official seal on what was happening on that day, representing the Sanhedrin. They approved of what was going on. But it didn't stop there with Saul. In chapter 8, verse 3, it tells us that Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them into prison. Uh, the, the Greek word here for ravaging the church, it means to ruin or to destroy. That was his aim. I want to destroy the work that Jesus Christ has begun. The reason that the believers fled Jerusalem was because they feared uh, ending up like Stephen or ending up in prison. But it goes, it goes beyond that even. 
Saul in describing his, his own life in Galatians 1, 13 and 14. He said, I persecuted the church of God beyond measure. Acts 22, 4 and 5 says he persecuted the way. These are followers of Jesus. They weren't called Christians yet. He persecuted the way to the death and imprisoned and punished others. In 1 Timothy 1.13, he's described as a persecutor and a violent aggressor toward the church. And in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, Among sinners, he was foremost. Saul was more righteous according to the law than you or I could ever hope to be. But he was also more sinful than you or I could ever hope to be. He would persecute and punish and imprison and even murder followers of Jesus. That's about as far away from Jesus as you or I could get. So what did God do with this man? Busy persecuting the church? Standing in approval as Christians are murdered? Binding them, throwing them into prison? I want you to see the heart of God toward sinners here in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. That's where we're going to pick up. It says, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murders against the disciple of the Lord, went to the high priest. He's still doing this. This wasn't a one-time event. This was his life. This was his passion. This was his work as a member of the Sanhedrin. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus. When the persecution broke out in Jerusalem, the believers fled. And one of the places they fled to in particular was Damascus. But Saul's not content for them not to be in Jerusalem. He doesn't want them to be. He wants to punish them. He wants them to stop following after Jesus. So he's like, I need letters. I'm going to go get them in Damascus. And ultimately, he wants to bind them and imprison them once again. So he asked for these letters. So if he found any belonging to the way, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's Saul. That's the direction of his life. That's what's going on. He's nearing Damascus on this day, probably thinking about what's about to go down, the people he's going to find. In verse 3, it says, As he was traveling, it happened that he was, as he was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, the, the flash of light, it would have it blinded Saul, by the way. You're going to see that in the text just for a minute. He finds himself blind. He's hearing a voice. And, and here's the deal. This is what's remarkable. Um, he didn't know God, but he knew this was God, right? He was not like walking with Jesus, like, oh, I recognize this must be Jesus talking to me. Uh, but God appeared to Saul in such a way. He spoke to Saul in such a way that he knew that this was God. God. It was a bright light. It was a voice from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, I would submit to you that if you are extraordinarily zealous in your pursuit of God, and you can quote the scriptures, you can lay out the spoken law, the oral law, the Mishnah, and you, you, you know all the ancestral traditions. You're a member, even if a junior member of the Sanhedrin, which basically kind of speaks on behalf of God to the people. Um, you don't want to be found persecuting God. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said to him, Who are you, Lord? This is a bit of an acknowledgement, isn't it? He would have declared or known the name of Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would have known exactly who God was, and yet in this moment, he's confident that God is speaking to him. He has now uh, met with God on the road to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. So how did God relate to Saul? We're going to see it spelled out here a bit more in the text as we go. But the first thing I want you to see is that for this man, who was far more righteous according to the law than you or I will ever be, but also more sinful than you or I will ever be, uh, God, in his goodness, while he was still breathing out threats and murders against the disciples, God 
saved Saul. And this is about enough for us, isn't it? We could just go home and be like, God saved Saul. What a remarkable act of love and grace and kindness and compassion. The mercy that God exhibits here among this man who was persecuting his followers and putting them in prison. Like, wow, we have a good God, right? We could quit. But God isn't done with Saul. He's going to continue. Read with me in verse 7. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but they saw no one. They weren't physically blind, but God was not in physical form, right? They couldn't see him. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. I don't know if you've ever gone three days without food and drink, uh, but he must have been in a fairly bad state at this point. He can't see. He's had no food. He's had nothing to drink. Verse 10, Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Now, if you're Ananias, this is not what you want to hear, just for the record, uh, because Saul is the guy, and Ananias knows. uh, He's here with letters from the officials in the Sanhedrin. Uh, He wants to arrest us and and take us bound to Jerusalem. Like, I don't want to hang out with him, right? That's not someone that if you're a follower of Jesus, you want to spend much time with. It's the last guy you want to spend time with if you're a follower of Jesus. Ananias answered him, or I'm sorry, he's seen in the vision a man uh, named Ananias come in, lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man. God, are you sure you know what you're doing? I've heard from lots of people about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. To bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So this man, who is more sinful than you or I could ever even fathom, God chooses to save him. But it goes far beyond that. God also chooses to send Saul. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So he saved him, and then he sends him somehow. Nobody wanted to see Saul coming. I mean, anywhere Saul would have gone, people would have known the things that he'd done. And if you show up, and you're going to go preach in the synagogue. They would have said, isn't this the guy that held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen? Isn't this the guy who's carried men and women off, bound, and put them into prison? Isn't this the violent aggressor toward the church? Everybody knew what Saul had done. Surely God could find someone better, right? This is the last guy you want to send to go talk about how good God is or whatever. He's literally defamed the name of Jesus and persecuted the church. God saved Saul, and God sent Saul. In verse 17, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he got up, and he was baptized. So this man Saul, who was the most noteworthy among all of his peers, trained under Gamaliel, Hebrew of Hebrews, he's a Pharisee. I mean, he's got a resume a mile long, um, decides that Saul.inc is going to close down, and instead he's going to live for Jesus Christ. When he's baptized, he's declaring, it's no longer about Saul. I am here to live the life on behalf of Jesus Christ as one of his disciples. This is remarkable. God saved Saul, and God sent Saul, but he wasn't done there. And he took food and he was strengthened. 
Now, for several days, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Uh, I want to note here how quickly Saul decided that he should obey God to go and be his witness. It wasn't like, all right, listen, I've blown it for most of my career. I, I didn't get it from the scriptures. I didn't know who God was. Let me go get some training. Give me a few years to get my feet on the ground, and then maybe I'll go do some, like, evangelize a little teaching or something. i got to reputation I need to overcome? No, no, no. Immediately upon coming to faith in Jesus Christ, regaining his sight, being strengthened, he goes and begins to proclaim the gospel. All these who, those who hear, all those hearing him continued to be amazed. And they were saying, is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on his name, who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Everybody's shocked. Everybody knew Paul's story. They knew his sin. They knew what had gone on. Surely not Paul. But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And so of this man, who was more righteous according to the law than you or I will ever be, but also more sinful than you or I will ever be, God chose to save him and sent him, and then he strengthened him for the work. Like, what, what Saul didn't do is sit back on his resume and all of his knowledge, and let me just reason. It was God who was strengthening Saul for the work. If you begin to read in the New Testament, you're going to know that very quickly here in Acts, they're going to start to refer to him as Paul. He went on to go to the Gentiles, and he preached the gospel in churches everywhere. He planted churches all uh, across kind of the known world at this point. He did three missionary journeys and led countless men and women to faith in Jesus Christ. God saved Saul, he sent Saul, and he strengthened Saul for the work that he had for him. So what can you and I, 2,000 years removed, learn from what we understand about Saul in the book of Acts? What can we glean from his life? Number one, I would want you to know that you and I, we, we can't save ourselves. Saul was more righteous according to the law than you or I will ever be. He was found blameless in his application of the law, and yet it took Jesus Christ coming to him, appearing to him on the road to Damascus to save Saul. Good as he was, as much of the Bible as he knew, as zealous as he was for the traditions, Saul's righteousness was not good enough to save him. Um, here's the thing. Saul was relating on the basis of the law, right? How well am I observing the law? Now, the problem is that the righteousness of God, the standard of God, if we're going to have fellowship with him, is perfection, right? Right? Now, Saul was pretty darn good, right? He killed it. When he did sin, he would offer a sacrifice for that sin, kind of follow all the right things that he was supposed to. But just like you and me, Saul had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, this standard of perfection. And so Saul's righteousness, somewhere down here, it wasn't good enough. But of Saul's own lips, in 1 Timothy these were his words in 1 Timothy 15. He says, this is a trustworthy statement, deserving of full acceptance. He's like, write this one down, and he did in his letter to Timothy. It's a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Y'all, that's why Jesus came, because there was a gap between uh, God and his perfect righteousness and ours. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so Paul, he's like, that's why Jesus came. You want to know why the cross happened? Why Jesus was born in the flesh, God in the flesh, and he lived that perfect life? You want to know why Jesus came? It was to save sinners. It was to deal with that gap between God and us. While our righteousness wasn't good enough, we'd sinned against God. We deserved punishment on the cross. Jesus took all of our sin and our guilt and our shame, and he bore the just punishment for sin there on the cross. God turned his back on Jesus. He poured out his wrath on his son. But here's the good news. God took that perfect, sinless life that Jesus Christ lived, 
And for those of us who come to faith in Jesus Christ, he credits that to our account. So it's no longer our unsatisfactory righteousness that wasn't quite good enough, uh, but instead we are given the perfect righteousness of Jesus, which means there's no more gap between us and God, that we can know God, we can interact with God, we can be saved. So the thing that I would want you to know here is that you can't save yourself. Paul was more righteous according to the law than you or I are. And it wasn't good enough. The second thing I would want you to know is that Jesus can and he will save you. You might temp be tempted to believe about yourself or maybe even somebody else that, listen, I'm too far gone. Uh, not only have you sinned, but you've sinned a lot. And you've sinned in rather dramatic ways. Or maybe you've sinned so many times after promising God, time after time after time after time, God, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to turn back toward the addiction. I'm not going to look at the stuff on the Internet. I know I shouldn't again. I'm not going to cheat on my spouse. I'm not going to cheat on my taxes. God, I'm going to follow after you. And yet, if you're honest with yourself, not one of us here has been made righteous in our own works. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And some of you out there are like, oh, you don't even know. But here is the good news that we can see from the life of Saul. He was more righteous than any of us, but he was also more sinful than any of us. And if God can save Saul, God can, and he will save you. Here are the rest of Paul's words. He says, It's a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he, he continues on, Among whom I am the foremost of all. He's like, if there was a race to see who was the best sinner, who blew it the most, who went the furthest, who did the, the, the worst possible sins, I would get first place in that. I am the foremost of sinners, he says. Yet for this reason I found mercy. These are the words of, of, of Saul himself. For this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost of sinners, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe on him for eternal life. For the person who's out there that thinks you're too far gone, and there's no hope, and God could never save me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what's in my past. Man, I live a life of shame and guilt. And I've, I've, been, I've, I've argued against God. Listen, Saul persecuted God. He imprisoned believers. He even put them to death. And God saved Saul as an example to you that he can and that he will save you. There is no sin that is too far. There is no sin, amount of sin that is too great. God is still a better Savior than you are a sinner. His grace is greater than your sin. So you and I, we can't save ourselves. But God can and will save us. He delights in it. That's why Jesus came. That's why he took on flesh. That's why he endured the suffering of the cross to save us. The third thing that I want you to see is that Jesus sends those whom he saves. So oftentimes we, we kind of think of ourselves as, okay, maybe God has saved me and I made it in by the skin of my teeth. I, actually, I was, I was giving Paul a run for his money. He might have got me, you know, right there down the home stretch and he might have been the worst of sinners, but I was pretty close. And then we believe this thing about ourselves, well, God can never use me. And people know what I've done. People know what I've lived for. It's a small town. Everybody knows the things that I've done. And yet, again, Paul is this example to you an example to me that for those people that God saves, he sends us out into the world. And he sent Saul into a bunch of people who were like, uh, I'm, I'm not hanging out with that guy. He puts people in prison for being Christians. And we might, we might get beat up and bashed with rocks for being Christians. This guy it would have never gone anywhere that people wouldn't have heard about his reputation. I mean, you think you got a reputation in Poto. I mean, you would have gone anywhere in the known world at that time, and they knew about Saul. They knew about what he'd done to Stephen. They knew about what he was doing to Christians. And God's like, 
hey, congratulations, Saul. You're going to travel the world on missionary journeys and tell people about me, right? He was the one that if you profess Jesus, he was going to put you in prison. And here he is professing Jesus Christ himself. God sends the people that he saves. And I don't know what it looks like for you. For Saul, he told him, hey, you're my chosen instrument. You're going to go to kings. You're going to go to the people of Israel. You're going to go to the Gentiles. I'm going to use you there. I don't know what that looks like specifically for you. But God has sent you into anywhere that you find yourself, into the family that you've been sent into, the workplace that you're in, like the, you know, the, the friend group of your kids because your kids kind of dominate your life, right? The people that you sit next to at ball games, God has sent you to those people. And if that overwhelms you, it should. Because in and of yourself, you have nothing to offer any of those people. But that brings me to my fourth point. My fourth point is that God strengthens those whom he saves. This man Saul, man, his reputation was destroyed. Everything he thought he knew blew up in a moment on the road to Damascus. And as he approaches these people who know where he's been, they know what he's done, God strengthens Saul. And in the same way, for those of us who are saved, God strengthens us for the work. You might be sitting out there and you say, oh, I don't know enough. Man, I can't, can't convince anybody. I, I get really sweaty if I ever talk about Christ. You might sit out there and say, listen, I'm still in my addiction. My marriage is still falling apart. My kids have still gone astray. Here's the good news. God's strengthens those whom he saves. And there is hope for you in the midst of your addiction that you couldn't overcome on your own. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, because of the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, there is hope for you to walk in freedom from that addiction. With the Apostle Paul, if he used the man who tore down the church to build it up, he can use those of us who've been a disobedient just a bit to teach others how to obey, can't we? Isn't that what God can do? Isn't that how he works among his people? He takes weak things of this world to confound the things which are wise. Those of us who are broken and sinful and once were hopeless, and he fills us with hope. God strengthens those whom he has saved. Can I just tell you today that you might think that your marriage is beyond hope because you've been battling for years, but God strengthens those whom he saved. And because Jesus Christ is present in your marriage, there is hope for you. You might think your finances are a complete wreck and there's no hope for you, but I want you to know because you have the spirit of the living God in you, there is hope. There is hope for you in your addiction. There is hope for that broken family that you live in. There is hope for this city which is riddled with poverty and drug abuse and even domestic sorts of abuse. Like There is hope because Jesus Christ is here, y'all. In our nation, which is nuts, right? We, we read the news. There is hope for our nation because st Christ strengthens those whom he has saved. And he is sending us out to our city and to our family in the midst of your marriage and your broken finances, in the midst of addiction and brokenness and abuse and all of the things. The church of Jesus Christ is there. And if God can save Saul and send Saul and strengthen Saul, God can save and send and strengthen you to do his work. There's hope for our world because the church is still here and God is still doing what he's always done. Jesus Christ, he came to save sinners. And we get to join him in that work because of what he's done for us. The gospel is good news we don't have to beat people up and tell them how awful they are and they need to get their butts in church. That's not what this is about. This is, let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done for me. Paul would say, man, I'm an example of the worst sinner that got saved by Jesus Christ. And for us, we might not be able to say we're the worst, but we can tell where we've been. We can talk about our past and our pain and our brokenness and how God has injected hope into our lives through the power of the gospel. That is being a witness. Here's what Jesus Christ has done for me. In verse 31, I want you to read what continued to happen in the church. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, they enjoyed peace 
being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. God, would you do it here? God, would you save more people in my family? God, would you save more people in my workplace? Would you save more people in this city and in this country and in our world that is broken? Y'all, we are the stewards of this message of hope. So today I want to invite you to cry out to God to do for you what he did in this man Saul. Maybe today you cry out and say, God, would you save me? Man, I'm going to trust that you're a better Savior than I am a sinner. Would you save me? Maybe you're a believer in Jesus Christ who's been sitting there in apathy since the day Jesus saved you. You've never gone and been a witness for him. Maybe you've been too afraid. Maybe you haven't believed that God strengthens those whom he saves. But today is the day where you say, God, would you open my eyes to the opportunities around me? Would you show me what you have called me to? Help me to see my mission field. But today, would you just respond in obedience to the Word of God and to the leadership of His Spirit in your life? Would you bow with me? I want to pray for you. God, we are overjoyed with hope. You read statistics about our county, and they're all bad. We're one of the poorest, um, one of the highest in drug addiction, domestic abuse, God, it's, there's a lot of negatives here. But God, we have joy because what we know is that the church of Jesus Christ is here. And in the same way that you opened the eyes of the blind, you made the deaf man to hear and the lame man to walk, God, you can teach that poor man or woman how to live. That abusive situation, you can bring healing, Father. For the addicted, you can set them free and God, you do your work through the church of Jesus Christ through us. So Lord, our confidence is not in ourselves, but it's in you. God, may you continue to have your way in this church. And I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.